Hi guys, welcome to another edition of Roundtable Discussions. As usual, I'm here joined by my brother Michael, uh, our own Dr. Rudolph Everyone, and today we have the privilege and honor of being with Dr. Bill Harris to discuss the many misconceptions around omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which is a topic of much debate. Dr. William Harris is an expert in the field of omega-3 fatty acids and their impact on our human health. With a PhD in human nutrition, Dr. Harris has been researching omega-3s for 43 years. My goodness. His extensive research has resulted in over 400 publications in the medical literature. He's been recognized by the American Heart Association for his contributions to the field. He's also co-invented the omega-3 index, which quickly became the gold standard measure for omega-3 status in over 200 clinical studies. Uh, I don't know if it's correct to say that you're the godfather of omega-3 and omega-6 <laughs> research. The term is godfather. Godfather! <laughs> but, but let me ask you something. <laughs> Have you been married longer to omega or your wife? <laughs> um, good question. Uh, uh, about the, about actually the omega. Really? Omega, actually. Oh, yeah. Look at that! All right. Well, listen, we're proud of you. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and thank you for educating the public. And you know, this I know that this is a, a topic of a lot of different opinions. And so, what better than to hear from the horse's mouth than the master, right? Happy to give my opinion. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. So I love the term "godfather" that you said. <laughs> so I think we should start with the basics to go over what are omegas. Uh, because even me growing up, I think we all did. My, my mom forced me to have cod liver oil because I think everybody knew the importance. And as I grew up, you know, I, uh, I went to medical school, I have a nutrition background. I knew in the back of my mind those are important, but there's so much noise and misconceptions about omega-3s, uh, omega fatty acids that I want us to start from the beginning. Tell us what it is and what are the actions on our body. Sure. And uh, God bless your mom for giving you cod liver oil. God bless her. You wouldn't be as smart as you are today. And actually, she was giving you cod liver oil for vitamin A and D. They didn't know about they omega-3, know about omega. which was in it too. But th that was not why they gave it. Um, but it was great in those days. So what are omegas? Uh, first of all, that term omega uh, comes from the Greek alphabet, alpha and omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, yeah. right? And the, the, <clears throat> the reason that got tagged on to fatty acids is because the fatty acid is a long chain of carbon atoms. And there's a first first one and a last one. The first one's called the alpha carbon, and the last one's called the omega. And if you count back three positions from the last, the omega carbon, you get to the first double bond in the molecule. Omega minus three. Oh, and if you oh. count back six, you get omega minus six. And those omega, the, the positions of that double bond is important in its biology and its function. But the omega-3 family all has this structure of the first three bonds, or the, the, being in the third position from the end. And the omega-6s all have the first double bond and the last uh, six positions from the, their end. And they can't be interchanged. Humans can't. Mammals can't change one to the other. Plants can do that. but. Um, so they got the name omega minus three fatty acids because there were three positions in from the omega end of the molecule. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes they're called N minus three. That's another term yeah. for it. And it's usually that means it's the nth carbon, the last carbon, three positions back. So anyway, it's, yeah. it's not, you know, f fancy space age stuff. It's just yeah. it's some guy named Ralph Holman in the 1960s came up with this idea of calling him omega. And so there are two families, as I suggest, of what we'll call the the essential fatty acids. And both omega-6 and omega-3 are essential, meaning they have to be in the diet. Mm -hmm. In the same way vitamins, have, we can't make them uh, from scratch. So we have to get them from the outside in. Have yeah. to eat them, right, right. right. Uh, now, if we just talk about the omega-3 side, there's really a plant source of omega-3 fatty acids called alpha-linolenic acid, ALA. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can get from Soybean oil is one of the major sources of it in our culture here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only about 7% of the fatty acids in soybean oil, but it's still, we eat so much soybean oil, it's, that's where we get it. Right. But it's a rich, you know, a, like a <clears throat> flaxseed oil is 50% ALA. Um, chia seed oil, I don't even know what the percent is, but chia seeds have it too. Uh, that is the plant omega-3, and that can be 
converted to a varying extents, but typically less than 5% of it can be converted in the body to the, the marine, the, the omega-3s we think about, EPA and DHA. Uh, how effective that conversion process is, is really not clearly known, but it, it's not very effective for getting high levels of omega-3, of EPA and DHA. <clears throat> On the plant side, there's ALA, and it's converted to a little bit to EPA and DHA. So EPA and DHA are the ones that come from fish, fish oils. Although they're originally made in nature by a plant, they're made by a, what's called a microalgae, mm -hmm. which is really a single, it's not seaweed. It's a single cell so. um, organism in the ocean that's really at the base of the food chain. And they can take sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and they can produce fatty acids. They can make omega-3 fatty acids. So plankton qualifies it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. and it, that's part of it too. Uh, Maybe that's why whales do it. Well, <laughs> whales get it from, yeah, well, some whales get it from krill, which have gotten it from the phytoplankton. Right, you right, know, right. right. Uh, so it seems like essential fatty acids are essential to almost every organism. That's how life kind of started. Yeah, well, I think that's fair to say. Um, wow. There's certainly, when we say essential in the nutrition sense, we mean you've got to have them because yeah. you can't make them. Uh, but there are, I mean, like, the, the, almost further down you get the, the food chain, animals can make more and more and more of the stuff they need. They can make it. Mm -hmm. They don't need vitamins. They don't need yeah. vitamin C like right. we do. Yeah. Um, but the right the essential means that they basically you die without it. Without it, um, you can't recycle them. Yeah, right. You can't recycle them. The, the, I think one of the controversies in the omega three space is: can you get enough from plant sources of this ALA? Is that enough? To, and you know, one level you could say, well, yeah, you probably can, uh, f because you know, look at uh, like a subcontinent of India, where a large number of people are vegans. They don't eat any preformed EPA or DHA, because that only comes from animals, only comes from fish. But still, they, they're they born, they live, they grow, they reproduce. Um, so I'm sorry, if, we can, if I can understand. Yeah. So plants make ALA. If a human consumes plants, ALA, and in the body, it turns into DHA, DHA and, and EPA. Yeah. And this is what is essential to the human Right. Physiology. Right. In, in nutritional terms, we, we don't talk about EPA and DHA as being essential. We talk about them being beneficial mm -hmm. because you can't get levels in your blood that we know to be protective against heart disease and maybe dementia and a variety of yeah. other conditions just from ALA. Mm. But can you live and breathe and exist without yeah. eating EPA? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's you want the opposite. Well, your brain but is you not want... going to function very well. So this is be... now a quality of life issue. Yeah, well, this like is you're, optimization. You don't have a protective yeah. cap over your your health. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, it, it, it's a it's a it's a controversial area because again, you look at an entire billion people in India. A lot of them not eating EPA or DHA, right. but how? But they're okay. Right. You know, they ain't stupid. Right. You know, well, they're, they're getting <laughs> curcumin. They're getting lots they're of in, antioxidant, they're, they're curcumin, anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So I think that the the debate is, uh, you know, existing versus thriving. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way of saying yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And so that's the the interest in EPA and DHA, the two that are made from uh, that are in made again from these microalgae, but we find in our diets from seafoods. Right. Um, that whole story began with Eskimos in, in Greenland. Some uh, Danish doctors in the 1970s were fascinated with the idea that there seemed to be very little heart attacks among these native, um, the Inuit right. in, in Greenland. Anyway, so <clears throat> they went to uh, Dyerberg and Bang were their names, and they went to Greenland and they, they analyzed the food. Uh, they, they discovered these odd long chain fatty acids in the blood and the food of these people and that they really hadn't seen before. It turned out to be EPA and DHA. And th through a series of experiments, they figured out that the those were what was protecting these Eskimos from eating. Well, I mean, their diet was terrible. It was very high in meat, mm -hmm. saturated fat, cholesterol, no fruits and vegetables. No, you know, we would think awful. Just flesh. But, just flesh. But they were doing Carnivore. fine. I mean, they had other problems, you know, I mean, infections and other things like that. But they, um, this is really what started the omega-3 revolution. Wow. And 
I just happened to be getting into my PhD work just at the time these papers were coming out, and so I got interested in Omega-3 and been riding that pony ever since. It was, did you start uh, researching because you had a health issue or you just fell in love with Omega? No, because I was told to by my boss. <laughs> by your boss? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is an important issue, Bill. Get on it. Uh, <laughs> it is. Yeah, well, yeah, he was, I, I, I was working, I finished my PhD in nutrition. What, what year was that, if you don't mind me asking? 78. So at this time, there wasn't much talk about right, it, so no, those papers no, were just research. coming out. No, just starting, I mean, right. The, the, that was when the Danish guys were publishing their stuff. But we, it wasn't in the, on anybody's radar. Yeah. Um, and the guy I was working for, I, I went to do a postdoctoral fellowship, so it's just like an internship and mm -hmm. in, in a residency in medicine. Uh, I went to Oregon, Oregon Health Sciences University, and the guy I was working for, Dr. Connor, was very interested in, in those days, you know, how do we control blood cholesterol levels? How do diet, diets affect cholesterol? Mm -hmm. And we knew about saturated fats, hard fats like uh, you know, butter, you know, Crisco and things like that. We knew that they raise cholesterol levels in the blood if you eat them. And we know that if you ate vegetable oils, seed oils, uh, your cholesterol level would go down. But what we didn't know, it was, and almost all of the really hard fats, typically lard, tallow, etc., came from animals. But the liquid fats, vegetable oils, were, were liquid at room temperature. So we didn't know if it was, you know, why does cholesterol go down with one and up with the other? Is it because it's an animal product, or is it because it's a hard fat at room temperature? Is it animal plant? Or, we didn't know. So Dr. Connors thought, huh, how about salmon? They're an animal, but they're, the oil from fish is liquid. Mm -hmm. So let's feed a bunch of salmon oil to people and see what it does to their cholesterol. Mm. So that was my assignment. Wow. Told me to do wow, that. look at that. Wow. Back this in the day. So you're the salmon the man. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he said the codfather. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what results did you find when you started? We, well, we found that, yeah, we, f we recruited healthy volunteers from around the medical school campus and we f fed them in our metabolic kitchen. They came and ate three meals a day there and we sent them home with a bag on the weekend for a month and they were eating about 100 milliliters a day of, of salmon oil. They were drinking it. Wow. They were drinking so all the fat yeah. in their all the fat in their diet was from salmon oil. It was way more than Eskimos. That actually. translates to how much milligrams? Of About twenty five grams of omega three oh, wow. EPA. That's a lot. It's huge. A lot. Yeah. It's a huge mm -hmm. dose. But, but this was kind of his idea. Let's just you know hit yeah, him with a shotgun and see what happens. Yeah. You know, nothing happens. We can go right. go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we found was it lowered the triglyceride levels in blood. Well. Nobody really knew that fish oils lowered triglyceride levels. Uh, they also lowered cholesterol, but they lowered it relative to the, the, the saturated fat diet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we said, when we published, we said, well, your fish oils lower cholesterol levels. And so all of a sudden, these fish oil manufacturers starting putting on their labels, lowers cholesterol, lowers cholesterol. Oh, wow. Right, but it was really triglycerides. It, well, it was not only, they, it was triglycerides, and that was clear, but when we finally started doing studies without swapping out the entire diet, just giving omega-3 pills mm -hmm. that don't change anything else, then it didn't lower cholesterol. It still lowered triglycerides. Mm. So the FDA kind of sent nasty grams to a bunch of fish oil companies saying, you're false advertising. Mm. It doesn't lower cholesterol. You can't say that, but it does lower triglycerides. And it turns out it probably does a lot. It does a lot more than that. But that's how it really got started, was lipids.